We're studying the New Testament, Book of Romans, Paul's effort to train a church to follow Jesus. That means that we're just going through it. This is a letter that was meant to be read in one sitting, one, one exposition, but it's too long, so we take pieces of it each week. Last week, Paul explained that obeying God's laws, his rules, out of fear is not an, an effective means for spiritual growth for the Christian. How could it be if we're forgiven of all of our sins, there's nothing left to fear? Instead, we need to focus on our new identity in Christ, internalizing God's written law so that we desire it from the inside, things that used to be commanded from the outside. He's going to continue that theme next week and all through chapter 8. But before pursuing that subject of spiritual growth anymore, he pauses for a moment to clarify that he's not criticizing God's law as if there's something wrong with it. He's going to praise God's law for what it does best. And this section, what it kind of takes the Christian back to how we came to faith in the first place. And for many of us, it's just going to be a refresher course about how we learned of our need for Christ. But perhaps for some others, it could be the key for some startling and some very, very important self-discovery. So let's start with Romans. We're in chapter 7, and we're starting in verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? <laughs> Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law hadn't said, do not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity affording by the commandment, it produced in me every kind of covetous desire. For apart from law, sin is dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me. And through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? <laughs> By no means. But in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it produced death in me through what was good. So that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. The key verse here is this. I would not have known what sin was except through the law. This is the central statement of the text. This is why the law of God is so very important. Understanding the nature of sin is always important at any point in a Christian's growth. But before we can truly appreciate the gospel message, we must be able to recognize sin in ourselves. And that's not an easy thing to do. Do you know what sin is? When the term is used in the plural, the word's a little fluid, but the way Paul's using it here, when the term is used in the plural, it describes specific actions. And most people understand sins as despicable and intolerable actions from society's perspective or from my perspective. Sins are things that I find offensive or I'm ashamed of. But what I find offensive or shameful has nothing to do with what sins are. Sins are not what I find offensive. Sins are what God finds offensive, regardless of how I think about it. Biblically speaking, sins are specific violations of God's revealed and written law. You shall not covet. You shall not steal. Don't condemn your neighbor. They're violations of his law. When the word sin is used in the singular, as Paul is doing it here, without an article, so we're not talking about sins or a sin, but rather just sin, it describes something deeper. Sin is not a type of behavior. Sin is a quality of character. Sin is a quality of character that gives rise to sins, behaviors, that displease our creator. The well-known story of Adam and Eve describes humanity choosing to distrust God or trust themselves over God. We prefer to trust our own instincts and our own rationalizations. And it's what we've become. When you cannot trust your creator, then you cannot truly obey him. 
You can pretend to obey. You can be forced to obey. But you can't obey from the heart. You can't do it. Sin describes my inner predisposition to distrust God. That gives rise to sins, plural, behaviors that displease him. And Paul says that we naturally do not know. We do not recognize our sin. We're not aware that we have an inner predisposition to distrust God that governs everything we do. We don't know that kind of thing exists in us. How is that possible? How is it possible for something so big, something so important to exist, and we don't even know that we can't even tell? <clears throat> you know what a black hole is? The theory is that uh, behind this class of phenomenon that they're supposed to exist in an awful lot of galactic cores. Uh, if you go into the middle of a galaxy, uh, something happens. A star uh, of a certain mass collapses, and uh, there's so much gravitational force, it just keeps collapsing. And as it collapses, uh, its gravity pulls in more matter from the area all around it, pulling whole stars, and it just gets bigger, gets bigger. And as gravity becomes so intense that nothing can escape, not the most powerful rocket, not even light itself. And since no light of any kind, no radiation of any kind escapes from a black hole, it is literally impossible to see. It doesn't matter how powerful a telescope, it doesn't matter. It's impossible to see a black hole. You could be right up next to it. I don't recommend that. But you could be right up next to it. And you wouldn't see it. You would be unable to see it. Well, there's an obvious question. If black holes can't be seen, how do we know they exist? That's a good question, isn't it? And the answer is we can see the distinctive impact that black holes have on the space around it. As it pulls in more and more mass and it gets bigger, the incoming mass radiates energy as it falls in. Once the matter falls in, it's gone. It's in the black hole. You can't see it anymore. But the stars, the planets, the asteroids, the nebula, as they fall in, they give off telltale radiation in predict predictable ways. So if you know what you're looking for, even though you can't see the black hole itself, you can see all the matter radiating as it's falling in. Black holes are invisible, but they are exposed by their impact on the surrounding space. Sin is a black hole in our spirit. It's an inner predisposition at the core of our being. We can't see it. We don't notice it. The distrust of God, the self-centeredness that we feel seems perfectly natural. God's law, however, his written code, identifies specific concrete behaviors that expose a consistent, inborn prejudice against our Creator. Born of distrust, resulting in disobedience. And our sin is revealed indirectly. God's law reveals something bad about me. Does that make God's law bad? No, of course not. God's rules expose evil precisely because those rules are holy and they're righteous and they're good. We can't see our sin, but God's rules expose our sins. And they tell us that at our core, we are dead toward God. We are unresponsive to him. There are many health threats that we cannot see. We can't feel them. We can't see them. We have no way of knowing they're there. But an x-ray or a CAT scan or an MRI can expose what is otherwise unknowable. I just heard last week again of someone who got an MRI to check something out, and they found something else they weren't looking for, something very serious. They just didn't know it was there. And now that kind of information can save your life. We don't realize that our spirits are dead toward God, especially if we're religious types. That deadness is invisible. God's law is like a spiritual MRI that exposes what's going on under the skin. And it's a godsend because you can't treat as a threat something you don't know about. Biblical Christianity has a profoundly different view of humanity than most of the world. 
or the rest of the world. Many believe that at our core, people are good, or at least born good. Many others, perhaps many more others, believe that at our core, people are neutral, born without any predispositions at all, and we become good or become bad as we choose. And those ideas make absolutely perfect sense. If you believe that good and bad, right and wrong, are ours to define, then all people are saying is that we have the ability to become what we want to be. And I, Yeah, well, that's true. We become whatever seems good to us, makes sense at the time, or is approved by our society. We choose to make choices that we think are good for us. For humanity, defining what is right or wrong or good or bad for ourselves is the only way of living we can imagine. Self-centeredness is natural to us. We don't even notice it. Biblical Christianity proclaims that we were supposed to be we were designed to be God-centered. And the fact that we are not is called sin. It's a falling away. It's a, it's a missing of the mark. It describes a condition of the soul that we are born with. We're not born good or bad or neutral. We are born with a predisposition to distrust and thus disobey our Creator. And we exercise that as soon as we're old enough to make decisions. We were designed to be God-centered, and we're not. But we can't see that that's true. How can we see a lack of God-centeredness? How do you see the absence of something you never knew was supposed to be there? It's like looking for a black hole. Oh, but you can, you can detect black holes if you observe the space around them. And that's why God gave us his written law, his written code. We can't directly see our deadness to God, but we can see the impact that deadness has on everything about us. God's law touches on dozens and dozens of subjects. Before Christ came into our lives, which of God's law did you even want to obey? Don't worship any idols. Well, actually, I, I do treat lots of things more important than I treat God, and that, uh, that's the way I want to live. How about do not steal? Well, I guess I have stolen sometime. Do not commit adultery. Go on. Don't covet. Don't uh, be envious of others. Well, I really can't not want stuff. I just do. I mean, well, let's just focus on the basics. This is the basics of God's law. Principles so fundamental, every religion agrees. Like loving your neighbor like yourself. Does anybody believe they have ever lived that way consistently? See, the law is outside, originally written on stone. You know, really couldn't, can't change it. It reveals the truth when it bounces off of us. Not only do we fail God's rules, we don't care. The point is that God's law has the capability of exposing a black hole in your soul you cannot otherwise see. Because we don't naturally care about God. We don't miss caring about God. God's law reveals there's something profoundly and deeply wrong, incomplete, broken inside. Not for some of us, for all of us. We were born with a part of us that's supposed to respond to God and it's dead. It's unresponsive. God's law demonstrates that I do what I think is best for me always. God's law shows us that we can't obey God because we don't trust God. If we didn't know that before, we didn't realize that, well, the law shows us that it's true. The Bible's rules have the potential to set us on a journey to find our creator and trust him. Fill up, fill in that black hole inside. And after trying all manners of philosophies and religions and spicy experiences, we just may find Jesus Christ. If we hear the gospel, the gospel, he died and he rose. If we hear that gospel and believe it, we can finally become convinced that God is someone we can trust. He died for me. Do you see how the gospel is the answer to our deadness? 
We can't obey God because we don't trust him. Because of what he did, Jesus Christ is the one person who can change that. I often tell the story about how a computer hacker and an unexpected encounter with the gospel led me to make a confession of faith in July of 1969. That was a, such an important event. We celebrate my rebirth day every July. But truth be told, that gospel might not have become anything more than a curiosity if it wasn't something that happened three months later. The gospel was attractive to me, but it wasn't really necessary because it dealt with sin. I just didn't see myself as much of a sinner. I was a good kid. I planned on doing great things for people and good, all kinds of wonderful things. But the law got my attention because I realized, well, I didn't see myself as a sinner. I didn't fail my expectations. I certainly failed when I'm obeying these, these laws here. And one night, it just kind of all came together all at once. And I discovered that I had never, there had never been anything in me that wanted to obey God. I never had any desire to obey him because I didn't trust him. I trusted me. Once I saw my life in terms of obeying God out of trust, I suddenly saw past the few sins that I recognized to my sin, my alienation from the living God. I discovered a black hole in the center of my soul. And once I saw that, I realized that my life was full of sin. Every action was a fresh sin. Not because everything I did was gross, but because everything I did was about me. There was nothing that arose out of trust or obedience. I needed the gospel, not only to, for the forgiveness of my sins, but to find in Jesus a reason to trust my creator with my life. God's law exposes sin. That's what it does. That's what it's good for. That's very important for anybody who's saved because once you actually learn to trust God, your life becomes all about wanting to obey him. And that's a long, hard journey for the soul. We got so much to unlearn, so much to retool. We'll talk about that next week. But that's what trust does. If I trust you to give me directions, I'm actually going to drive where you told me to go. If I trust you to train me in combat, I'm going to try to do what you told me to do in combat. Trust does that. It creates a desire to obey. And that makes the law of God a redeemed person's written guidebook, and it's very, very handy. But friend, if you have a black hole in your soul so that you're unable to respond to God, then you need God's written code more than anyone because you desperately need to discover a deadness inside that will destroy you. You can postpone dealing with it for a while. You can focus on your job or your family or your bucket list, but you can't put it off forever. You can only put, off, you can only put it off until it's too late. Well, Pastor, I don't feel dead inside. I'm alive to hundreds of things. Well, of course you are. Are you alive to God? What does his law reveal about what is going on or not going on inside with respect to him? How much energy do you spend using the Bible to root out ungodliness and grow in righteousness? Do you respond to God's laws with a passion to experience them, or do they just leave you cold? Do you ever review your life, identify sinful actions, confess them, and try to make plans to live differently? Not because they make you feel guilty, but because they don't belong to that person God wants you to be, and you trust him. He knows better than I do what I should be. When it comes to trusting and obeying the Lord, is there anything alive in there? Salvation comes from simple faith. Christian assurance comes from evidence of fruit, evidence of life. And so I have an assignment. And for everyone who's born again, this is going to be easy. It won't be a big deal. But for others, it just might be the most important assignment you have ever had. Check for a spiritual pulse. 
check for a pulse. This week, read the Ten Commandments. Read the Sermon on the Mount. Read something from the Psalms or any one of the letters in the New Testament. Read what, what, does, God, what does God have for you? What does he want you to be? What are we looking for? We're not looking to see how healthy we are. We're just checking for a pulse. Okay? Just checking for a pulse. What does this law reveal about your soul? Do these things, these commands in there, do they excite you? Do they encourage you? Do they give you a vision for what you want to be? Or does it do nothing? Nothing. Because you really don't trust what it says better than the way you want to live. Use the law as a scanner to see what is going on inside. It can't hurt you. But what it exposes might save your life. What does God's law reveal in your soul? Does it reveal a person who cares about what God thinks? Or a person who is put off, who is bored, who is distrustful of what God thinks. If the written code tells you that you are coveting, that, that your envy, that your lust for things is wrong, do you trust that assessment and focus on contentment? It's a lifelong journey. Maybe, maybe actually simplifying your life. Or if the written code tells you that the way you're pursuing sex is wrong, do you trust that assessment and seek for ways to change your sexual experience according to what God has said in his word? If the written code tells you that the Sabbath is God's gift for you, do you trust that assessment and plan your week so that your soul can be regularly refreshed? Now look, Maybe you think that what I'm doing here is I'm criticizing you or I'm condemning you for some specific sin. If so, you just aren't hearing me. I can't do that. You haven't invented a sin that I haven't fallen into in some form. Ultimately, I don't care about your sins. Your sins won't kill you. There is no transgression that God would not forgive. What kills people is a deadness to the Lord inside that doesn't care about our transgressions. That's a black hole of sin that will suck the life out of you. Friend, if the law tells you that you are essentially unresponsive to God, what can you do? How can you make yourself alive? Well, it should be pretty obvious you can't. Nobody can make themselves alive. There's no potion you can drink. There's no religious incantation or ritual. There's no donation you can make. But the gospel proclaims that Jesus can make you alive to God. He can make you alive to God. He can not only forgive your sins, he can overcome your sin and give you a spirit that trusts your creator again. You'll never conquer all of your sins in this life. But that won't matter if your spirit comes to life before you die. So what should you do? You should do what needs to be done in order for Jesus to find you. Fill your mind with the gospel. Fill your heart with the gospel. Once there was a preacher named John Wesley who realized he didn't trust God. He asked a friend, what should I do? They said, well, keep preaching his grace. Keep preaching it until you believe it. He did. Spend time with Christians who understand the gospel like you would spend time with a doctor who knows how to save your life. Read books about the gospel. Listen to music that embodies the gospel. Pray. Whether you feel anybody's listening or not, pray anyway until something inside stirs. Keep praying. And God will make you alive. Seek the Lord, the Bible says. Seek him all night. Seek him all week. Seek him all year. God says, if you seek me, you'll find me. Because there's a little gospel mystery that I'm going to let slip. The reason you'll be seeking him 
is because he's drawing you to himself. Be a good time to pray. Let's pray. Lord God, we want to thank you for this great trouble you went to to provide us with your written law. It wasn't fun to find a black hole in our soul, but it was so glorious to come alive in Christ and enjoy the hope that comes with him. Thank you. Father, all of your children here, we all join together to pray for those of us who just don't know how dead we are. Some of us are vivacious and confident and happy, but we're not happy with you. We don't really appreciate how much we distrust you. So please, Father, would you let your law do its work to expose that black hole inside? And then, Lord, then, then open eyes, open minds to your Son. And let us find in his cross all we need to trust you. Let the blood of your Son cleanse us completely and cause our soul to come to life to you. Hear our prayers, Lord. We lift them up in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's